Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce AJ Jacobs, who's joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. AJ is here today to discuss his book, Drop Dead Healthy, One Man's Humble Quest for Bodily Perfection. As many of us do, AJ felt comp compelled to change his ways and get healthy. He didn't, however, want to just lose weight or lo lower his cholesterol. His goal was far more ambitious, to become the healthiest person in the world. AJ Jacobs is an experiential journalist and editor-at-large at, at Esquire magazine. He's a contributor to NPR and has written for the New York Times and Entertainment Weekly. He is also the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Know-It-All, The Year of Living Biblically, and My Life as an Experiment. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, let me just start off with a little irony here. I, uh, I have been talking so much about health in the last few days that I've lost my voice. So uh, I do not sound very healthy. I feel good, but I sound like I have consumption or something horrible. Um, so please excuse me. Can everyone hear me? Is that uh, it's good enough? Yeah? All right. Um, well, it's great to be here in Seattle. By the way, the eighth healthiest city in the United States. So congratulations on that. <laughs> I just came from Los Angeles, which is the 41st healthiest, so I feel much better. Uh, I'll be taking a lot of sips of water to keep my voice in, intact. Uh, I, uh, I thought today I would talk briefly about my first two books and how they led up to the current book. Then I'll talk about the current book and take any questions you guys might have. Uh, so for the last decade or so, I have been subjecting myself to a good amount of pain and humiliation, but hopefully for a good cause. Then that cause is self-improvement. And I've tried to do this in three parts. So first I tried to improve my mind, then my spirit, and now finally my body. So to take the mind very briefly, this one came about because after college I felt that I was getting dumber by the minute. My IQ was just gently, not so gently, sloping downward. Uh, and I decided I needed to do something to fix this. And I got an idea from my dad because when I was a kid, my father started to read the Encyclopedia Britannica. From He wanted to read the whole thing. He didn't quite make it. He made it to the middle of the letter B, right around Bolivia, uh, because he had a life. Uh, so he, uh, he abandoned it. I decided I'm going to try to finish what he began and remove that black mark from our family history. Uh, so I did. I bought a stack of encyclopedias. The, uh, may they rest in peace. Uh, you might have read they no longer are. They just announced they're not printing the print version of the Britannica anymore. Uh, but I, I bought the, uh, the old print version. And, and it's a, it is a pretty long book. It's like 33,000 pages and 44 million words. If you stack the volumes up, they go to about here, which uh, I, I think I said uh, it's a Danny DeVito of knowledge in the book. Uh, and uh, so I just started reading. And it was a, um, it was a painful year. And, and I, I was actually physically painful. I, I got a new glasses prescription. And it was also, uh, it was a little painful for those around me. My wife started to fine me one dollar for every irrelevant fact I inserted into conversation. Uh, I was just so enthusiastic. But it was also a wonderful year. It was amazing because I got to spend time with the most uh, fascinating people from history. Uh, and, and it was also uplifting because I, after reading the whole span of, of human history, uh, I, got, I, I felt that the, that the good that we've done as a species outweighs the bad. Not by much. It's pretty close. But overall, we, progress is real. Uh, you look at our lifespan, it's tripled. 
you look at uh, the level of violence, even with the horrors of the 20th and 21st century, the rate of violence is way down from what it used to be. And Steven Pinker talks about that in his new book. Um, I, since I finished, this was about five years ago, I have forgotten a lot, probably 98%, I would say. Uh, but I, I will say 2% of the encyclopedia is a lot better than where I was before. So I feel good about that. And since this new book is about health, I'll tell you my favorite health-related fact that I still remember, which is that in 1898, the Bayer Aspirin Company uh, patented a very effective cough suppressant. Does anyone know what it was called? Heroin. That was the, uh, oh, you said it? I didn't hear. Well, uh, yeah, heroin, it was a, uh, that, that was the original uh, purpose. Turned out it had some side effects, <laughs> uh, so they had to adjust their marketing a little. Uh, unintended consequences, a big part of human history. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I, I loved the experience, and I thought, what can I do next? Uh, is there a book that's even more influential than the encyclopedias? And that's when I decided, I'll try, let me study the Bible. I knew nothing about religion. Uh, and this was the impetus for this project, is I, I had no religion growing up. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So <laughs> nothing against the Olive Garden, which is a fine restaurant. Uh, <laughs> But I had kids, and I wanted to know what to teach them about religion. You know, am I missing a, an essential part of being human by not having any of this spirituality? So I decided uh, I'm going to try to learn about the Bible by actually living it, by reading what it says and following it, and following in the footsteps of our forefathers. So uh, I gathered a board of spiritual advisors, and so I had rabbis and ministers and priests, scholars. And then I bought 20 different versions of the Bible. And uh, I, I wrote down every single rule that I could find in the Bible. Uh, and as you might know, this is a very long list. There are hundreds of rules. And I wanted to follow them all without picking and choosing because I wanted to see. You know, millions of people say they follow the Bible, but I got the idea that you know, they just pick and choose the parts they want to. What if you just followed everything? What would that be like? How would it improve your life? How would it not improve your life? So I, uh, I wanted to follow the famous ones, uh, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. There's a picture in case you forgot what it looks like. Uh, love your neighbor. That's an important one. Be fruitful and multiply, uh, the first rule in the Bible. Uh, and I was, by the way, fruitful. I did multiply. I had twin boys during my year, so there they are. Uh, <laughs> and I take my projects very seriously. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to follow the, the hundreds of rules that do not get as much attention. You know, the Bible says that you cannot shave the corners of your beard. That's in Leviticus. I didn't know where the corners were, so I just let the whole thing grow. <laughs> And, uh, and I had quite the topiary on my chin by the end. There I am at the end. So, uh, and my wife would not kiss me for the first, last six months of the project. And, and uh, seriously, I did spend a lot of time at airport security. That was uh, like hours. Uh, the Bible also in, in Leviticus has a rule that you cannot wear clothes made of mixed fibers. And this one seems so strange to me. You know, it seemed, why would God care if I wore a polycotton blend? It seemed like God was micromanaging my life. Uh, so I thought, uh, but then I said, you know what? There's no way for me to know if this rule has any meaning unless I try it out. Uh, so that's what I did. I got rid of my polycotton clothes. And I will tell you, one of the surprises of the year is that some of the stranger seeming rules did start to take on meaning for me by the end of the year. Not that one in particular, but I uh, still can't get my mind around the mixed fibers, but some of the other ones. Uh, it was an incredibly challenging year uh, because uh, you had rules that were hard to follow in many different ways. First of all, 
I had to make this huge moral makeover of myself, you know, because the Bible says that you cannot lie, you cannot covet, you cannot gossip. And I live in New York City and I work as a journalist. So that, that's like 80% of my day. Uh, so I had to figure out how do you become a better person? And one of the secrets I learned was that to become a better person, one strategy is to pretend you're a better person and eventually you become a better person. It's sort of the uh, fake it till you make it idea. Uh, and it's, I was really astounded by how much the behavior shapes our thoughts, how much the exterior shapes our interior. And, uh, and actually, you know, cognitive psychology backs this up. If you act in a certain way, you will eventually start to feel that way. Something as simple as smiling. If you force yourself to smile, then the studies show that your brain thinks you're smiling and you become a little bit happier. So that was one strategy I had to be a little bit of a better person. Uh, I also had to follow another difficult type of rule, which was uh, rules that, that did not jibe with modern American customs. And there were many of these. One that comes to mind is stoning adulterers. Uh, which is in the Hebrew scriptures quite a bit. Um, and I, so I figured I should at least try to stone an adulterer. And I was able to. I was able to stone one. I'll tell you very quickly how it went down. I, uh, <laughs> I was in Central Park, and this was sort of the middle of the year, and I was really trying to get into the project. And as I said, exterior shapes the interior. So I was actually trying to look as biblical as possible. So I had... Uh, uh, I had the beard and the robe. I did not have the sheep. The sheep is, that was a rental sheep for the cover shoot. But, uh, but I had some of this other stuff. And a guy came up to me and he says, why are you dressed like that? And I said, well, I'm trying to follow all the rules of the Bible, from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And he says, well, I'm an, adul an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And I said, well, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> I was like, so excited. Because I had been waiting for, uh, for months to run into an adulterer, a self-professed adulterer anyway. And uh, I took out, I had been carrying around stones in my pocket, hoping uh, for this day. And I took them out. They were small, like pebble size. He turned out to be a very aggressive adulterer. And he grabbed them out of my hand and threw them at my face. So I thought, an eye for an eye, that's also in the Bible. I can toss one back at him. So that is how I checked that off my list. Now, at the end of the year, I stopped stoning adulterers. I shaved my beard. Even though I did grow to love it a little, it was like a pet. Um, but I had to get rid of it for my wife. Uh, I, uh, but there's dozens of things that I've kept from the year. It was really a, a life-changing experience. And uh, I don't have time to get into all of them, but I'll just give you two quick ones. One was that. It changed my, uh, my worldview about gratitude because the Bible uh, talks about how you have to say thanks. You have to say prayers of thanksgiving. And uh, so I was taking this literally. I was saying thanks for everything that good that happened in my life. Even the little stuff. I would press a, uh, the elevator button. I'd be thankful the elevator came to the lobby. You know, I'd get in the elevator. I'd be thankful that it didn't plummet to the basement and maim me. Uh, and it was a weird way to live. But it was also, there was something very beautiful about it. Because you, st you realize there are hundreds of things that go right every day that we totally take for granted. And we focus on the three or four that go wrong. Uh, so it was a radical change in perspective, and I try to keep that. You know, I try to be thankful this, this mi microphone is working. That's like a little mini, mini miracle. So I try to be thankful for the little things. Uh, secondly, uh, it did change the way we decided to raise our kids, uh, and because neither my wife and I are very religious, but we thought we would, uh, we did end up joining a synagogue at the end of the year. Now it's a reform synagogue, and we don't really go, so <laughs> that's not true. We go sometimes, not so often. But, uh, but I actually, I, I thought, I don't care if my kids uh, 
decide to become religious or not religious, as long as they're good people, as long as they're minches, uh, as we say. But I thought it would be nice to give them just a little taste of their heritage, a little, little foundation so they can reject it or accept it from a, a point of, no, a place of knowledge. Uh, so I had done the mind, I did the uh, spirit, and I enjoyed them so much I thought, well, I'm neglecting one big part of my being, the physical. Uh, so what if I did that as my, my, the final part of the trilogy? And the, uh, I needed quite a bit of help because I had ignored my body for about 40 years. I was, uh, I was what they call skinny fat. I don't know if you know that term, but I looked like a snake that had swallowed a goat. Uh, so I, uh, and I got hospitalized with uh, pneumonia and my wife said to me, you know, listen, I don't want to be a widow in my 40s. You've got to get in shape. And so I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in like my other projects. I'm going to test every piece of medical advice I can find, see what works, see what doesn't. Uh, so I got myself a board of advisors, bodily advisors this time, so doctors and nutritionists and trainers, and I wrote down every piece of advice that I could find. And, and this was as long, if not longer, than the Bible list. Uh, there were 70, 80 pages of, of things you had to do. That was one of the first things that struck me, is, is that this, if you are uh, going to follow all the medical advice, there's really no time in your life for anything else. You've got to quit your job, because uh, it, it is a packed day. You've got to exercise, uh, meditate, meditation. There's a lot of research on th that being good for your brain. Uh, put on sunscreen, and this is no small thing. If you talk to the dermatologist, we are we are under appliers by 50 percent. You've got to fill a shot glass full of sunscreen and put it on your body every two to four hours. That's a lot of sunscreen. Uh, you have to pet dogs. That lowers the blood pressure. I didn't have a dog, so I would go to the, the dog park and pet dogs there. When people let me, sometimes they were creeped out, but you know, it was all for a good cause. Uh, you have to prepare food, you have to eat food. And if you are eating properly, this is not a small thing. Uh, they, I ran across this movement on the internet. They're very passionate about chewing. They call their movement Chewdyism. And uh, <laughs> they are, that's their pun. I'm not a big pun guy, but that was theirs. Uh, and they say, that we should be chewing uh, 50 to 100 times per mouthful, which is crazy because that, it takes like a day and a half to eat a sandwich. I don't recommend that. But their point is right. We do need to chew more uh, because chewing, you get more nutrients, but more importantly, it slows down your eating. Anything that to slow down your eating uh, and control your portions is good. And as you probably know, the body uh, it takes 20 minutes for the I'm full message to get uh, from the stomach to the brain, which is crazy. I know that like, uh, if there are any engineers out here, they, they would have designed a much better system uh, than that, but we're stuck with it. Uh, as, as part of the year, I wanted to try everything out. So first, I, want, I quantified everything. I wanted to track my, uh, my progress, so I, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I took some brain tests. I took, uh, this is a sleep test. I took, shockingly, I did not get a very good night's sleep that night. Uh, <laughs> who knows why? Uh, I, uh, I also tested out, I had never really done exercise, so I wanted to test everything. So I tested from the hardcore exercise. There's CrossFit is probably the hardest core exercise there is. Uh, they are, uh, their mascot is called Pukey because the idea is you exercise until you're nauseated. Uh, and uh, I tried uh, stroller sizing. This is where you push a stroller around and jog. It's like uh, using your kid as a, a exercise equipment, basically. Uh, I tried, I got into the paleo movement a little, the idea that we should be living as cavemen. So I did the paleo workout, which is, uh, Years, but you know, cavemen did not belong to gyms. So this, you got to work out in the in the wild. This is Central Park, is my wild. So we take off our shirt and shoes, and we throw boulders and uh, carry logs. Uh, it was it was a I had a great time. It's not something I do on a regular basis, but uh, it was 
uh, a fun experience. Uh, I wanted to try out all of the diets that I could. So I tested out the, uh, the raw food diet. Uh, and I tested out the paleo diet, which is all about eating a lot of meat and very little grain, because their idea is grain only came around in the last 10,000 years with agriculture, so we should not be eating that. Um, one of my, I, I tested out something called calorie restriction. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. That's the idea that if you eat very, very few calories, uh, like 70, 60% of what, what normal people eat, then you will live a lot longer. You will live 100, 120 years. And of course, the, the reaction most people have is, yeah, but why would you want to if you're just eating, you know, it's a hard, or if you, uh, uh, you, you may not live that long, but you'll feel like you're living that long because it's such a horrible life. Uh, <laughs> But I went and I spent some time with these guys. And there is, by the way, a little science to back this up, but mostly in animal studies. If they starve mice and monkeys, then they do seem to live longer. Um, and, uh, but w I had a meal with these guys. Uh, our appetizer, everyone got a single blueberry. And then for the main course, we went crazy and had a walnut. So that was my entire meal with them. Uh, I. Uh, <laughs> I thought that, I, oh, I, uh, I also tested out all sorts of different equipment because uh, I thought, you know, I want to see uh, what works and what doesn't. I tried this suit that sp supposedly it's a compression suit. They're very popular now that help you recover more quickly from workouts. This, the strangest piece of equipment I got was, uh, was this one. This is called Nature's Platform. This was a big surprise during the year because uh, I found out I had been going to the bathroom incorrectly for 40 years. Uh, no one told me. Uh, and, uh, and there's actual science behind this uh, that our bodies were not built for sitting on a toilet. We were built to squat. Uh, and, and there are studies that show if you squat, then you, you, ha you get, uh, prevent hemorrhoids, much lower risk of hemorrhoids. And, and it does go faster, it's more efficient. It's harder to read, which is sad, but, uh, uh, but it does go faster. So this is, you can buy this on the internet. It's called Nature's Platform. And it's a, a platform you put over your toilet, and so you can squat and turn your toilet, your like first world toilet into a, you know, what they call a Turkish toilet. Uh, so I tried that. Uh, my wife did not think this went with the decor in the bathroom. So she's like, get that out of here. So I didn't have it for long, but it was an interesting experience. Um, I, uh, I thought I would end with, uh, well, I should mention, you know, by the end, it, it did work. It did work in a sense. I, I felt a lot better. I lost a lot of weight, uh, about 20 pounds, lost three inches from my waistline, cholesterol went down. You know, I, I, hesit I hesitate to say that I'm in perfect health, first of all, because I can't talk. Uh, and secondly, you know, if you boast about your health, then, then uh, you know, the way life works, I'll get river blindness tomorrow or some horrible disease. But I do feel much better than I've ever felt in my life, and my energy has doubled. Uh, so, so something worked. And I have, I've changed my life in dozens of ways since then, little changes and big changes. And I thought I'd just give you five or six uh, I'll end with just five or six takeaways of, of things that I've changed. One is I've really tried to, I'll take this off now so you don't have to look at that. <laughs> Here, I'll go back to this. Uh, there we go. Uh, I, um, I, I've really tried to avoid the sedentary life because which is hard, because I was very good at the sedentary life. I loved sitting down. Uh, but the research on this is really alarming, and it seems like there's a new study every day that how bad sitting at your desk all day is for your health. It really wreaks havoc on your cardiovascular system and, uh, and increases the chance of heart disease manyfold. Uh, so I... Uh, you know, when I'm sitting at my desk, I do try to get up every hour and walk around just for a couple of minutes. Research shows that that 
is uh, important. I, uh, I took it a step further and I got a treadmill and uh, I put my laptop on top of the treadmill and uh, I walk slowly while working. So uh, it took me about 1,200 miles to write this book. And I love it uh, I, because it keeps your focus up, uh, it uh, keeps you awake, and, and I am not a coordinated person. So if I can do it, I think uh, there's hope for everybody. Uh, I also, in, in the vein of keeping moving as much as possible, I, I adopted something uh, I call contextual exercise, which is the idea of trying to fit uh, movement into every part of your life. So uh, taking the stairs is an obvious one instead of the elevator, parking far away and walking. Uh, when I talk to my kids, uh, my kids are, are young, so I, I go down, I squat down and talk to them at eye level and then come back up. So I'm doing 50, 60 squats a day without ever going to the gym. I love it. Uh, I also decided I was going to try running errands. Literally, you know, that's what they call running errands. I'm going to literally run them. So I run to the drugstore and get a uh, toothpaste and run back home. So you can fit, uh, even if you don't have time to go to the gym, you can make a physical movement part of you. Uh, a second important lesson is quantification. You might have heard of the, uh, the quantified self movement, the idea that if you keep track of your body's numbers, then you will act in a healthier way. Uh, and there's lots of studies to back this up. I, uh, so even something as simple as getting a pedometer will change your life because you will walk more if you have a pedometer. Uh, the goal uh, that they recommend uh, the American Heart Association recommends is uh, 10,000 steps per day. And when you have a pedometer, it, it turns it into a game. Gamification is a big thing, I guess, nowadays. And that's what the pedometer does. You want to get to those 10,000 steps. So it becomes uh, a bit of a, a fun challenge. Uh, like when I used to, my kids are always losing their stuffed animals. And I used to get so annoyed uh, spending 20 minutes looking for their elephant. But with a pedometer, you're like, all right, I'm racking up, you know, 400 new steps. Uh, it makes it makes life much better. Uh, also, you can go further with this. You can uh, get there's there's all sorts of uh, gadgets now. There's the Fitbit, which is like a pedometer on steroids, which I got. Uh, I love this uh, device. I don't think you, it's not necessary, but it's fun. Uh, it tracks your calorie input and output. And I love their website because they are so detailed in their uh, list of how many calories certain activities expend. You know, it's not just tennis and running and walking. They have like the most obscure activities. I learned that baking Indian bread in an outdoor oven is 210 calories per hour. That's not a bad workout. Uh, horse grooming is 350 calories an hour. They have a, a sex, it varies. They have, they have it broken down by, by level of how vigorous you are in your, uh, in your, your sexual life. Uh, but about 110, 120 calories. So it's not a bad way, but not the, not the most efficient workout. Uh, I, uh, in terms of food, I had, I, just, I had to attack it in two ways. First, the quantity, and the, then the quality. In terms of quantity, uh, it's no big news flash. We eat way too much uh, food as Americans. Uh, and so uh, one, uh, one method to, that was successful was Judaism, chewing food. That's, uh, then there are all these visual cues you can use to make yourself eat less. Uh, you might have heard small plates lead to smaller portions, which lead to smaller meals. I took it further. I got, I stole my kids' forks and spoons, and I was eating with the small forks and spoons, and that actually worked. Uh, chopsticks is another thing if you want to slow down your eating. In terms of, oh, and don't multitask. There's, um, there are studies that say if you, uh, you consume 70% more food if you're watching TV while eating. So there's something to actually unitasking and just eating the food. You will eat less. 
in terms of the quality of the food, I had to uh, first determine you know, what, what makes for healthy food. And right now, the nutrition field, it, it, it is, there, there are two sides. It's sort of like Congress, uh, and they, they really disagree with each other. On the one side, you have the, the low-carb Atkins paleo side, and they, they argue that carbs are the root of all evil. Uh, Gary Taubes is a great journalist, and, uh, uh, and he, he's written several books on this. He's sort of the, the, the leading light of this movement. And, uh, and they say, you know, more protein, more fat, uh, vegetables, berries, uh, but very little uh, carbs. On the other side, you have the vegetarian, vegan, plant-based group, and they are uh, probably the, uh, the quintessence of this is the China Study, which is a very popular book uh, written by a Cornell nutritionist, and he, he studied 800,000 people over his longitudinal study, 40, 50 years, and his conclusion is that animal products are the root of all evil, that that is what causes heart disease, that's what causes uh, cancer. So, so you have these two sides. Uh, looking at the preponderance of evidence and, and all of the experts, uh, I think that there is more evidence right now to support the plant-based side. Uh, I think that the China study goes farther than the evidence uh, with warrants, so uh, uh, they, we don't know for sure that eliminating all animal f products uh, will eliminate disease, but it does seem that a plant-based diet is a little bit healthier. Uh, but that said, there are parts of the, uh, of the other side that I think make a very good point, and one of those is that refined carbs, uh, processed carbs like white sugar and white flour, those really are the devil. Those will make you fat just by looking at them. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I have right now my, my diet is a mostly plant-based diet, sort of similar to a Mediterranean diet. There's, there's a lot of good fats. I do eat eggs, egg whites and salmon uh, because I think there's some good evidence that that's good for you. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, but the white sugar and white flour, I think, is, uh, is something that actually both sides agree on. So you can, you know, people have disagreements, but both sides agree. Stay away from those, stay away from trans fats and stay away from the processed refined carbs. Uh, in terms of exercise, uh, I mentioned the uh, contextual exercise. The other lesson I learned was that uh, you don't, exercise is good, unfortunately. I looked for a study that said it wasn't because I, I don't love it. But, uh, but unfortunately, it's good for stress levels, it's good for your immune system, it's good for preventing heart disease, probably cancer, the whole thing. Uh, and, but the good news is you don't have to go to the gym for an hour or two hours. There's a, a growing body of evidence that uh, something called high intensity interval training is as good for you or better than, uh, going, to the, than uh, going to the gym for a long period of time. And the idea here is that you work out really hard and really fast uh, uh, and for a very short period of time. So uh, you, jog, like you, you sprint instead of jogging at a leisurely pace, you sprint for 30 seconds, and then you stop and rest for 30 seconds, and then you repeat several times. And you can be done with a workout in 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, so I do this, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it kind of freaks people out, because, you know, people's men sprinting uh, is, uh, is an alarming sight. But, uh, <laughs> but I do find it very effective. Uh, two, more, uh, two more points, one is, I, uh, another surprise of the year was the, about how it's not all about diet and exercise. There are other very important parts of health. One I never saw coming was how important, uh, how big an impact 
noise can have on your health. Uh, because we live in an incredibly loud world, way louder than in, ever in history. And, uh, and our bodies were not built for that. And it doesn't just hurt our hearing, which of course it does, but it also has effects on our cardiovascular system because a loud noise evolutionarily would signal a threat, so it gets your heart rate going, gets your uh, adrenaline going, and uh, over time, this is bad for your cardiovascular system. The, uh, there's a study that says that people who work in noisy environments have two to three times the rate of fatal heart attacks as those who don't, uh, which is pretty astounding. So I, uh, I try to live a much quieter life, which is not easy because I have three young kids, so it's not a quiet life. But I do have these noise-canceling Bose headphones I love, and, uh, and I've tried all sorts of earplugs. Uh, the best, by the way, is if you're looking for earplugs, the best I found, was, they're called Surefire, and uh, they were designed for the military and law, law enforcement, so they're pretty hardcore, uh, but comfortable. Uh, and, uh, and finally, speaking about stress, uh, that is a real, another big pillar of health. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of evidence about how it really has a physical effect on your immune system and your heart. And, uh, and one of the things I found is during this year, I was so obsessed with health that it was kind of stressful. So you can become uh, unhealthily obsessed with health. Uh, and there's actually a doctor I interviewed who has come up with a term he calls orthorexia. And he says that it's a new eating disorder. It's for people who are unhealthily obsessed with healthy food. And his argument is that if you are so obsessed with getting just the right locally grown organic quinoa with all the right antioxidants, and you spend all your time on that, then your life is out of balance. And, and if you can't go out to a regular restaurant with friends, that's not that healthy because friends and social connections is a huge part. It's really correlated highly to, uh, to longevity. So going out to, to, uh, to dinner with friends, very healthy. And even also having a drink while you're out there if you, if you do drink. Uh, one drink a day, uh, possibly two for men. That's also correlated to longevity. So go out to, go out to dinner with your friends. Don't get too stressed out about health. Uh, because the whole point of health in the first place is to be around so you can spend time with your friends and family. So that is my, uh, my, my some of my conclusions from my project. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. So thank you again for having me. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, did, do I, should I repeat the question or did every, oh, the question was, how did the order of my projects affect their outcome? Well, I think that uh, probably doing the mind first was a good idea because I've always been obsessed with information and, uh, and trivia or, uh, uh, you know, useful knowledge and totally useless knowledge. So that was very helpful. Uh, to, to wade in that way, as opposed to health, where it, I had no interest in. You know, I, I, def, I did not want to go to the gym. Uh, when I first went to the gym, my wife uh, brought me a uh, power bar with a little candle on it as like a congratulatory gift. Uh, so that was, uh, so I'm, I think I did it in the right order, although I'm probably just rationalizing because I do think that 90% of life is about rationalizing your decisions. So, uh, uh, any, uh, who else, any, yes, sir? So, how did you weigh some of the studies you read about like diet and food uh, against what people, like say Michael Pollan would say, which is like, there's plenty of ways of eating that have been tested with like thousands of years of evidence. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think that uh, I agree with Michael Pollan. Oh, the question was about how do you weigh the evidence of diets versus 
the Michael Pollan's idea that the tradition of eating this way has thousands of years of evidence. Uh, I do agree with Michael Pollan in that nutrition science right now is we're still in the dark ages. Uh, we don't know uh, enough. Um, we do know we do know the basics, and people agree on the basics, which is what he talks about: whole foods, mostly plants, uh, controlling our portions. Uh, but in terms of, you know, if you eat pineapple because it's got, uh, you know, selenium, then that's going to prevent prostate cancer. That's overreaching from the evidence. Uh, so I, um, but I do agree. With, I do think that you can look at all of the studies and find ones that are find the common ground. The way I look, try to look at health data is like. You know the website Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, so when I go to a movie, I never just look at one reviewer and say, oh, he liked it, therefore I'm going. And I try to do the same thing with health data. I look at all the legitimate uh, information that I can find, all the legit legitimate sources, and, and sort of find their common ground and, uh, and try to follow that. Uh, because uh, you can so easily get an outlier and, and follow that. And I think that's what you get. You know, a, a huge number of people in America just latch on to one expert, you know, who says, oh, you have to eat this for your, if your blood type is A, you have to eat all vegetables. And it's just crazy. There's no evidence of that. So looking at all of the preponderance of evidence, that is one of the very important lessons I learned. Yes, sir. I was tracking, uh, well, my, my steps, and, um, and, and I was also, I got in one of those full-on executive physicals at the beginning where they take every fluid in your body and they do like 400 tests. So uh, I was able to uh, track my cholesterol, which went way down, and, um, and I was surprised to learn uh, you know, if you look hard enough, you can find things wrong with you that you didn't know were wrong. Uh, <laughs> so that was disturbing. I, re I did not know that I had lower than average testosterone. So that was a shocker. Uh, I, turned, I was able to get my testosterone uh, a little bit higher, so now I'm in the normal range. I'm not like in the, you know, Silvio Bersconi range, uh, but... Uh, but I'm sort of in the, the mid-range now, so I feel pretty good about it. But, um, but tracking, I think, uh, as I mentioned, is, is huge. Just keeping track of the numbers will make you act healthier. Did you check your weight or your body fat index? Or anything like oh, yeah. I checked my weight and my body fat index, uh, body fat percentage. And, um, you know, weighing yourself, there are studies that just weighing yourself every day will, will keep you uh, healthier. And there's this... I forget how it's pronounced, we thing or why thing. I don't know if you've heard of this app, but it's a, a scale that connects, that tweets your weight. So if you, you get on a scale and it tweets your weight every day, I didn't do that. But I will say that social media is a good way to, uh, a good motivator to get healthy. I would, uh, I had this uh, Twitter feed of uh, my health sins. And you know, every time I sinned you know, and had a, a, a waffle, I would confess it, and my friends would make fun of me. And that was actually a, uh, a good motivator. And it can go the other way. You can say, hey, I ran three miles today, and your friends will congratulate you. So I think, actually, peer pressure is, is a very good motivator. It can be used for good. Yeah? So uh, you had touched on this question. Did you change your sleep habits? I did. The question was about sleeping. Um, uh, yeah, it, you know, sleep. I was disturbed to learn is, is just uh, one of the big overlooked uh, pillars of health. Uh, you really do need seven to nine hours a day, which is annoying because I'm not a big fan of sleep. But, uh, but if you don't, it affects everything from your, your heart to it lowers your IQ. Uh, if you don't get enough sleep, uh, your mood is hugely affected. So I, I did try to get more sleep. I, um, uh, a couple of quick tips. One. I had insomnia, uh, and I found the most effective way to, uh, to go to sleep, I talked to all these sleep experts, and there are actual studies that say counting sheep does not work. 
that will actually make you stay awake longer. But what does work is if you count backwards by three, so take a random number like 685 and count backwards by three, 682, 679, 676, and that is just challenging enough and just boring enough that it'll put you to sleep. And I, I recommend it so highly. That changed my sleep habits. You know, I am, you guys are probably much better at math than I am, so you might want to, you guys might want to go with like 17 or something. But for me, <laughs> three was enough. Uh, so that was an important one. Um, uh, also, not looking at uh, computers or, or LED screens for a half an hour, an hour before sleep, not just because the internet is exciting, it's got all sorts of stuff, but because the, the blue light from those screens messes with your melatonin levels and can keep you up. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's more sleep stuff in the book because it is a huge part. Yes, sir. You've the mind, the body, the soul. What's next for you? Mm. Uh, the question was, uh, what's next? And I, you know, I haven't decided yet. I am. Uh, uh, I get a lot of suggestions from readers, which I love. Uh, one of them that I've gotten several times is that uh, they say that my wife and I should test out all of the positions in the Kama Sutra. And I write about that. And I brought that up with my wife, and she's like, no way is that happening. Uh, honestly, I'm OK with that. I don't think it, I, even though I'm in much better shape than I ever was, I don't have the flexibility for some of that stuff. So, uh, uh, so I usually come up with a new project about a couple of months after my, my current one comes out. So I've got another month or so. But if you have any suggestions, please email me. Anyone else? Uh, one, last one? OK, sure. So if you change the frequency in which you ate and or the portion size? Uh, did I change the frequency I ate and or the portion size? Yes. And you know, there's, there's not a huge amount of data on this. Uh, there's conflicting data, but um, for me, I think it's a very individual thing. For me, eating six smaller meals a day is, uh, I find, much more effective. Because when I get hungry, I tend to just eat whatever's in front of my face. So I'll eat horrible stuff. So if I can keep the hunger at a mid-level, I eat a much more healthy diet. Uh, but then there are other people who argue, that, if you, that, that snacking is bad and that you should just have the three meals. Uh, again, I don't think that the science on this is, is settled, but for me, I go with the six meals. I love it. And smaller portions. Well, thank, oh, all okay, right, one more, sure. <laughs> right, oh, sure. Well. Um, I'll just tell you very quickly, it was about my testosterone change. I mean, well, first of all, when the doctor told me, uh, I was like, all right, well, you know, what, why do I want more testosterone? What's the advantage? And he's like, oh, it'll, it'll triple your sex drive. And I'm like, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm married. I'm married with three young kids. What, what is that going to do? For, what outlet do I have for a tripled sex drive? <laughs> so. That was a problem. But um, there are two ways to do it. One is the natural way, which is exercise and a healthy diet. The usual, the, the walnuts, salmon, those good fats do raise your testosterone. And then there's, the, uh, then there's the artificial way, which is testosterone shots or testosterone patches, which are becoming increasingly popular. Millions of men do that. Um, and, and the evidence, by the way, on that is, is mixed. Some people think it's like hormone replacement therapy for women and that it's going to totally backfire and we're going to find something horrible happens to men who do this. Um, but others say, no, it's great. It improves your energy. I took a middle road. This guy, I, uh, this urologist I found, there's a, a drug called Clomid, Clometrim, which is uh, usually used for women to uh, boost their fertility. But what it does is it uh, naturally uh, increases your testosterone without from internal internally as opposed to externally. So I took that for a while, uh, and it does reset your level of testosterone. So uh, so I do have a higher testosterone. Luckily, my sex drive did not triple, so I feel good about that. 
Um, but I did, I, I think it did help with my energy. So it's something to consider. Uh, well, thank you again for having me. I had a great time. And I, I will, by the way, if anyone has more questions or wants a book signed, I will be right back there. So thank you again for having me.